Hey everyone, my name is Perry, I'm an electrical engineer, and in this video we're going to watch The Big Bang Theory Season 8 to see how accurate all the science and technology in the season really are. Oh no. How the hell did a pigeon get in here? You shut the loading doors, right? I thought you did. Do you know what a disaster this is? You mean because this room isn't supposed to have dust in it and we just let in a flying crap machine? That's, that's really, really bad. Oh boy, yeah, there that that clean room is compromised and they, oh boy, that's who that's going to suck for them. A clean room is a regulated space that's designed to control contamination and it aids in the removal of airborne particles. For example, dust. And if you can't have dust, you're not allowed to eat in a clean room. Like you can't bring water in there. Like that's why they're dressed in those suits. It has to be the least amount of contaminants and particulates in the air as possible. And when you let a bird fly in there, oh gosh, that, that, oh. Uh, today, clean rooms are used in industries such as like semiconductors or the pharmaceutical industry or biomedical technology. And the primary reason for that, think about for pharmaceuticals, for example, is when you take a pill or a spray or wh whatever it is, you do not want anything else in that medication except for the medication. And uh, some other examples, so, Here's a terrible example. The FDA has a legal limit for how much rat feces are allowed in your food. I know that's creepy. I know how ridiculous that is. That bird just compromised that clean room in so many different ways. And I don't, yeah, I actually don't know how they clean a clean room. It's generally speaking, that should never happen anyway. But uh, that that's really bad news. I come to you for help and you insult me? I thought the least that Look, you would do would be- your anxiety levels are right in the zone. <laughs> really? Oh, that's fantastic. Now, wait, now, wait, they're dropping. Why are they dropping? Because you're happy they're elevated. Oh, that, that is a uh, experiment that has been, it, I mean, there, there are so many different experiments you can run when you put electrodes onto somebody's head to measure their brainwave activity. This one in particular, I'm very surprised that Amy, I mean, I guess, I, I don't know how formal this experiment is, but in general, you don't want the person that you're experimenting on to see the actual uh, wave functions on the computer of which they're being recorded because of that precise reason. Once they see that their brain waves or th their thoughts or their emotions are actually affecting the data, then it does, I mean, I guess you can still use it. I, I don't know how that would be handled per se, but it's, it's no longer considered, uh, Okay, wow, I cannot think of the word. I, I, have, I don't do research, I'm an engineer. But I can tell you that that data has now become heavily biased because the person whose information you're recording, they're influencing something that they're not supposed to be influencing. It's just supposed to be, here's a stimulus, how do you react to it? But if you are aware of how you react to it, then you are manipulating the graph to make it a certain way and you, that's not okay. You guys know the new Discovery Class missions that NASA's been working on? Yeah. Well, they're looking to include a message from Earth in case one of them is encountered by alien life. Oh, when I encountered alien life, I, I discovered that the key thing was not to sit in its spot. <laughs> there are actually a couple of songs that have been sent out into space by NASA. I think the most popular one is... Uh, oh, gosh, wow. It's a thing, it's the, the Beatles song, Across the Universe by the Beatles. That almost escaped me. But uh, Across the Universe is an interstellar radio message and like it's literally it was transmitted on february 4th 2008 and it it was from a nasa facility in uh, by madrid spain it was for the nasa's 50th anniversary and they sent it in the direction of the star polaris and i'm not sure what the distance on that is uh or what the frequency or any of that uh finer detail information the idea being if alien life was to ever come in contact with us then on their way to Earth, they would be, <laughs> they would listen to the Beatles because that's just so much farther away that that's what they have to move through to get to us. I hope that these aliens have a sense of hearing because you can't assume that they do. And there's a lot of animals on Earth that don't have sense of hearing. Uh, but if they do, then they get to listen to the Beatles before they get here. How do you mention bats and leave out sonar? You didn't let me finish. And also regarding the bat, it has so not. That is not correct. You know, it's not very often that I catch a scientific mistake in Big Bang Theory, 
Although, uh, th this is one of the rare occasions. Bats don't have sonar. They have echolocation. And uh, echolocation, it, it uses sound waves to detect their prey, and it also gives the bat a 3D location of where they are in space. The bat transmits sound waves from its mouth, and the waves bounce off tree branches or bugs or whatever else is in their environment back to their ears, and then that gives the brain of the bat, or its mind, whatever you want to call it, it gives it a 3D positioning of its location relative to all the objects around it. Sonar is radar that is used underwater. You can say that... Dolphins and whales use sonar. I mean, dolphins and whales, they actually use echolocation, but it's purely underwater, which is why you can say dolphins and whales use sonar, but uh, that, 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 that's the key difference is like, in fact, like, if we're going to use words like sonar, then you can also say that bats have radar. That would be more accurate because sonar is purely for underwater. You know what they all do, right? Yes, of course. <laughs> what about this one? Well, I... How familiar are you with miniaturized integrated logic circuits? Not very. That right there is a miniaturized integrated logic circuit. <laughs> okay, I do not know if that really is a miniaturized logic circuit. I, I can't tell just from that distance. How would he know? Because like he's holding a piece of hardware. Logic gates are software. So just by holding that up, you can say, I mean, perhaps you can say that this is because if anyone's built their own computer then you would know that uh, you can hold it like a ram chip in your hand or a microprocessor or uh, like memory sticks and they all have you know they fit on a motherboard which is generally green like the color that he's holding right now it's just that i i don't know how they could tell because uh if, if we're talking purely hardware that you you can't look at a piece of hardware and then say oh, this is going to be a NOR gate, or there's an AND NOR. I mean, these are all like logical circuits for um, a digital, like microprocessing, or, or microprocessing, uh, microcontroller, sorry. It really sounds like Howard just made it up <laughs> because I don't think he has any idea what's going on. I mean, j just because he's an engineer, that doesn't mean you can open any product and then point at each of the individual components and then say, I know what that does and this does and that there is that's just not gonna happen, uh, especially because engineering is so specialized that unless he's worked on drones in the past and he's gotten that detailed with them, yeah, they're screwed. Decent? I make twice what you make. Wait, twice? <laughs> yeah. Like, times two twice? <laughs> I went to school for half my life. I'm a doctorate. I'm still paying off college loans. That is uh, certainly something that a lot of physicists and chemists and many, many PhD holders of natural sciences will talk about is that your degree does not correlate with how much money you make. It's a very, very common misconception. And I mean, to an extent, Leonard has a PhD in physics, and I believe Sheldon has a PhD in physics and chemistry, but Having more PhDs or having a PhD over a master's, that doesn't really give you a jump in salary, for example. Especially when it comes to research, it, it, it doesn't really do much for you. If the goal is money, then getting a PhD is not in your best interest. It, it's, it's certainly something that you want to really look at and evaluate. If, if you really wanted, I mean, if you wanted to get a PhD, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just, that's almost purely for research. If you want to make money, go into sales. Just like what Penny is doing, pharmaceutical sales, they make a killing if you're able to perform at the highest levels. And it, it's also a matter of you can't scale what a lot of these scientists are researching. So if you think about a nurse, for example, there's no way a nurse will ever make as much as an engineer. And it's because uh, there are only so many patients that she can see, or he, if it's a male nurse, can see in a day. However, uh, I mean, we're not even going to talk about like, it's going to be descending the quality of care because you just see so many people, you get tired throughout the day. However, an engineer can write lines of code that they can be implemented amongst tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of automobiles, for example, or it can be military vehicles or aerospace. The things that engineers do scale very, very rapidly, which means a small amount of our influence affects a lot of products. And that is also a big reason why these tech companies are extremely profitable, but they're also paying their employees very, very highly. Look at how much a engineer at Facebook makes or Google, for example. It's because there's everything they do scales so heavily. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and I wish you all the best rest of your day.